Pip, pip, tally ho, Jules Guides here, in which I wander around London and tell you fascinating facts. Uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you like these videos. And of course, uh, don't forget to order my book, uh, which I keep going on about. Today, we are in Swiss Cottage, and it's going to be a bit of a trip down memory lane for me because this is quite, uh, quite close to where I live. So, uh, let's go. Looking through the window of a storm, things look so familiar. This is Swiss Cottage Library. I remember this one from when I was a kid. I mean, that next door is the, the leisure centre, which is where I learned to swim. I've got my uh, certificate, uh, Julian McDonald swam five metres. That's why I learned to swim in there. But, uh, but that used to be looking a bit, bit more different, because this is like <clears throat> from the 1960s. It was yeah. designed by a guy called Sir Basil Spence. He's a, he did Coventry Cathedral. I think he did the New Zealand Parliament, the kind of beehive building there. But then they, they redid it all, I think, around 2003. And now they've got a climb wall and all sorts in there. So yeah, it's all a, a lot more stylish than when I were a lad. What was it like when you were a lad? Was it like old Victorian or something? What was it? <laughs> no, <laughs> what was no, it, like? it was it was sort it of was it was because it was designed by the same it was that same oh, kind of I old see. and well, the, it was probably good because I quite like that design to be honest with you. Uh, I quite yeah, like I know. the uh, big library there. So, uh, and it's interesting to note as well the buildings behind there, those Art Deco buildings, they were, I mean they were probably built only about 30 or so years prior. Well, those buildings you're talking about there, they're actually from the 1930s. That is the Regency Lodge. Got some quite nice uh, details on the side there as well. These reliefs or whatever you call them. They represent the trades that were required to build the building, I think. At the time, it was regarded as an example of the best commercial flats that you could buy. It's just such a weird kind of road, a big chunk. Yeah, big wide roads, one-way systems and all yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, but it wasn't always like that. I mean, back in 1826, Henry Eyre, who owned all the, the land around there, and he decided that uh, he wanted to build a road along here. This was all like countryside back in the 1820s. And he, so he got permission, some act of parliament or something, to build this big road, Finchley Road, you know, an avenue road. And uh, I mean, I think it goes all the way up to, towards Barnet if you follow this around, well, anyway, but it's up to Finchley. Um, because it was quite a sort of quiet road still back in those days. I mean, one couple back in 1836, they were coming from Barnet along this road and they were robbed just outside uh, by, by highwaymen, just outside the Swiss Cottage pub here. Yeah. And the, the miscreants fled across the fields towards Kilburn. Then they did this redevelopment where they chopped up a lot of the lovely old road and they built things like the library and leisure centre and the Odeon there which came before the library actually. The Odeon's from the 1930s when all this main redevelopment started. Love Odeons. I do, I like, I like the mass sheet of brick wall. I saw the little table that stood in our breakfast nook The stove we got from mother where you first learned... Going down here, it's a, in Japan and Korea, places in Asia, they have this um, cherry blossom season. It's kind of, it's, it's a kind of uh, thing. And, uh, you know, everyone celebrates and they go out and take loads of selfies. And it uh, looks like they're doing the same here because it, it really does look like a fashion shoot. Without your pretty face in a little second store. My new handkerchief from... Uh, Laura bought it for my birthday, thanks Laura. But it keeps it's so silky and smooth, it keeps sliding down. It's a bit like if you si try sleeping on satin sheets. Ever tried, you sort of, sort of wake up on the floor, you've sort of slid all the way down. It's, anyway, yes, now just the, just near the, near the library and the swimming pool there is the Winch. This used to be the Winchester Arms, but um, in around 1972, it was kind of reclaimed by locals as it was all derelict. And they turned it into a sort of youth centre. It was one of the first places that sort of encouraged kids to do street art, I suppose. I'm not sure if that was a good thing, really. But it was, it was actually a specific wall just to do graffiti on. Building relationships, enriching community and fulfilling their potential. That's what they do here. Um, but I wonder if it's still operational. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. They look so dusty there And no one seemed to care In a little second 
Uh, yeah, well, this used to be the, the Holiday Inn when I was a kid. The, uh, the Holiday Inn is now the Marriott, where the uh, German football team stayed in the last World Cup. But uh, yeah, they've got these lovely elephants here. They, they spot them all over London. You can see all these elephant sculptures, and I discovered that it's to highlight the plight of the elephants and they're, they're the risk of them being extinct by, okay, by, by about 2040. You know, what I like about all the street signs in this area is you get these lovely individual tiles for each one like on the like on the back of the abbey road the album right. yes, that's yes, the yes. one that, yeah. so so it's hard to it's hard to find the, the abbey road I, i'm not sure if there's any of those at, uh, for abbey road left because someone nicked them all but uh, but these these are quite quite nice harley road where my friend harvey used to live um yeah near the school for the deaf which was um it was school for deaf children frank barnes that was called i think they've changed it now i don't I think it's no longer uh, school for deaf children, but now, now it's a part of a university, but they've still got the sign there, you see? So that's a kind of a remnant from those days. Anyway, hello, Harvey. That we got from our friend, how they thrilled my heart. So here along Adelaide Road, this, 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 this big tower block, we're coming up to Eaton Avenue, it's the next road on the right, and these big tower blocks here, they're all named after places like villages near Eton School. Like, I think Eton School actually owned a lot of the land around here. That's why all these tower blocks are all, all got these names like Taplow, Burnham, Bray. They're all villages near Eton. They're typical examples of those ones that recently had the cladding on them. And they spent years putting up all this scaffolding and uh, putting up, attaching all this cladding. And then they had this terrible fire at um, Grenfell um, due to this type of cladding. And they ended up having to put the scaffolding back up again and taking all the cladding off. Feels like years now. I seem to hear them whisper, you're to blame for you did wrong. Why don't you kiss and make up? There's only one listed building on Eaton Avenue, and that's actually this one here, which is number 69, I think. It's hard to, hard to make out with the sun right there. But um, that was built in 1890 for uh, John Collier, who was like, he's a famous artist. You'd like him, Simon. He's got quite a few things in the National Gallery, I think. And I love all these details you get in the brickwork in this sort of Victorian yeah, red brick lovely. buildings. They just don't do that anymore. Oh, yeah, look, it says 9-0, so it must be... Where's the 18? You see on there, you can see 9-0 in the middle kind of... It should say 18 somewhere because then it indicates that it was built in 1890. I always like the staggered windows going up, you know, following the stairs. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, but yeah. it's so beautiful, isn't it? And, look at that, and you can tell it's an artist's studio yeah, because... Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, look at all that light coming through. There's a big, uh, wonderful light going through there. Look at it. And look, you can see a JC there. John Collier, J.C. Oh, yeah. You see the little, can you get that? It's interesting about John Collier. I mean, he, he married the daughter of a famous Thomas Huxley, who was a friend of like uh, Charles Darwin or something, a biologist. But then he also married the sister of, <laughs> of that woman he had just married. So he married one daughter of Thomas Huxley, and then I think she must have died or something, and, and he married another sister. I think she died, otherwise they must have got divorced, and then he married her sister. That would have been really harsh. This is Central School of Speech and Drama. Just like locals just call it Central. I'll go to Central, you know. But uh, this was, it was opened in 1906. Carrie Fisher went here. Princess Leia, you know, Harold Pinter, this famous playwright. And do you know who they turned down? The great Sir Julian MacDonald. <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I, did, I did an audition for here. Oh, I was pretty rubbish, I have to say. I tried to do a speech from Equus and I had no idea. I didn't even know how to read it. <laughs> and then, so that was, the, that, was the, that was the kind of classic one. And then you had to do some modern thing. So I did a speech from The Matrix. Like, I did, you know, when he goes, Mr. Anderson, we understand you have been contacted by a certain individual called Morpheus. <laughs> I, I mean, no wonder they didn't, they didn't select me. <laughs> What use is a phone call when you cannot speak? Is this when it was literally playing in the cinema across the street? It's almost like you just came out of the cinema and just recited what you just saw. It's opposite the Hampstead Theatre, actually. Well, this Hampstead Theatre originally opened in Hampstead in a church hall in the 1930s. And then, I think, in the 60s, it moved to quite close to here, some sort of um, 
portable cabin around the corner okay. where I saw something called Burn This, starring John Malkovich. But it was really good. I enjoyed yeah. that. Seeing John Malkovich live, you know, it's kind of cool. I was really pleased I went to see that. But uh, I always thought it was a bit of an odd kind of building where it was. But anyway, um, it's here now. Hello. I love... Hello. Mr. Dapper Man. Hello. <laughs> I, love, I love backstages in... Uh, you know, I love it when they open, the, sometimes when you're walking around Covent Garden you see that, like the Opera House or something has got the back door, the stage door open and you can see all the goings on, yeah, the scenery, the back, yeah, it's so good. Can't go wrong with a biscotti brownie, I'll have one of them. Hmm, I can't do that. So it's amazing when they knock all these buildings down. There's always construction going on around this area. Um, uh, but, but it's a good day to go out with your camera and take photos because you, you get a view of, say, for example, the Odeon over there. So I love the fact you can see a different angle of the Odeon. Yeah. And once they build a building, they won't be able to see it anymore. So that was the first McDonald's I ever bought a hamburger in. My brother used to work in there. And he told me that you weren't allowed to wear your underpants, apparently. <laughs> Is that a thing? He said you, had to, you weren't allowed to wear your underpants in case that you dropped uh, hot fat down. You had to be able to whip off those sort of uniforms really quickly. I don't know if that's still the case. And next to it, in 1971, the first ever R Price. Do you remember R Price? It, it started out as, um, I think it was called Tape Revolution or something, because they concentrated on cassette tapes. I can't remember if it was there or if it was WH Smith so just along there. It was where I bought my first single, you know, shut up your face. <laughs> What's the matter, you? Hey, God, I know, respect. Let me know, guys. Tell me, what was the first single you ever bought? Mine was shut up your face. Well, it was like, three at the same time. It was Tony Basil Mickey, Don't You Want Me? And shut up your face, because my mum was Italian, so she found it funny. <laughs> yeah, so this used to be Toys, Toys, Toys when I came and bought all those. Do you remember those? Uh, God, people, people will remember this. This is why I'm going on about it. There was a brilliant toy shop where you used to get all those Paul Daniels magic tricks. Do you remember those? But just a bit further wrong is a very important place. Cosmos, look, Cosmo Restaurant was located here. It was opened by a couple of uh, Hungarians back in 1938. I think they were escaping uh, the, the Nazis. Many refugees, Holocaust survivors, they, they quite often used to meet in here. And the Faye Weldon, the famous author, her mother used to work in there. And she talks about it, actually. It's quite interesting. Put on the cabbage at 8 a.m., boiled it until 12, changing the water twice, then draining it and compressing it into chunks of kind of grainy green custard uh, to serve with Koenigsberger meatballs. <laughs> so I dare say quite a few people in the area will remember that because it, it didn't close that long ago. I mean, it was, like, it was open until the 90s. And many famous people used to dine here. James Mason, Sigmund Freud, James Fox. But upstairs was where Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, used to live as well. It was when he was studying at RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. He was living up there. They're quite nice, the buildings. I mean, they actually look quite nice uh, above street level. It's just the street itself. It really just seems to cut through, you know. But before they built this, back before the 1930s, there was this really beautiful building here, the New College, it was called. And it got demolished in the 1930s. It's an unrecognisable the area from back then. Well, one of the oldest, I think it might be the oldest shop along here, one of the oldest, is the Eurosports. Been here since 1976. I mean, I remember that as a kid, for sure. Oh, I bought many a cricket box in there. I remember my dad bringing me down here. Great tennis balls, tennis racket, cricket box. Have you ever worn a cricket box? It's the thing you put down your pants to protect your testicles. <laughs> it's like, they're such horrible items. <laughs> such horrible items. I never knew exactly, you know, whether you're supposed to wash it or what, you know. I mean, was a kid. Oh, disgusting. Can I borrow your cricket box? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that was it. <laughs> that, that was it. Sometimes, you know, you, if you went into bat and you'd forgotten your box, you had to borrow someone else's box. And some people would, like, put it straight into their underpants because we were only kids. Hang on, mate. Let's give, give me a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just take it out. There you go. Oh, the Green Cottage as well. That's a very respected Chinese restaurant. Do you know who else used to live down the street? Who? My brother. No, come on! No, no, you are making, no, yes. you are making it up. He lived with a. <laughs> you are making it up. He lived up. with a bunch of uh, Australians. This is when he first moved down to London. This could be a new feature on Jules' guides. Like where Simon's brother lived. Oh look, 
the way that this road, that little stretch along there, it's yeah. just so, like, when you have to walk along it, it feels like someone's carved this road right the way through there. It's always it, seemed a bit odd to it's me. It's one of those classics, you know, when you look above the shops, it looks amazing. It's yeah. one of those things. Yeah, they're beautiful, aren't they, up there? Pure Jim yeah, yeah. used to be Woolworths. It looks I, like a classic Woolworths, doesn't it, now you say it? Yeah, and then yeah. I remember it was Sainsbury. It wasn't just Sainsbury, it was J Sainsbury. Do you remember when it was J Sainsbury? The North Star Tavern here, look, that was from like 1850-ish. The IRA bombed it in 1973. In fact, they bombed quite a few places in Swiss Cottage. I think it was a um, pub down there got bombed around the same time. Just imagine that was here when this was just a beautiful old road surrounded by fields and stuff. It's quite remarkable. Do you notice know anything about my appearance today, Simon? No, nothing at all. My umbrella actually fits me. Look, it's an actually, actually a long umbrella that fits. I've always got short, and this is a proper one from James Smith and Son. So my friend Ted bought it for me for my birthday. So uh, thanks, Ted. Shout out. Ted, who features in my book, by the way. The rule of Ted features <laughs> in my book. <laughs> for any, if you're going to go to the pub, you go to the nearest one. That's the rule of Ted. Never, don't go looking for a nice one or anything. This, this uh, window ledge, funnily enough, this is where I found some credit cards when I was 15. I put them in my wallet like an idiot kid does. And then they, there they sat for a while. And I was wandering around near the Royal Free Hospital. And the plainclothes policeman stopped me. He said, oh, excuse me, we're looking for, uh, they all talk like that. We're looking for uh, a gentleman of your description in the area selling drugs. Have you got any ID? So I pulled out my wallet and showed them my ID. And he said, oh, what are these credit cards? <laughs> The bugger cautioned me and arrested me, yeah. stuck me in Hampton Police Station. My mum was horrified. She had to come and get me. And I was, I said, what do you use them for? I said, oh, well, uh, you know, making plectrums. And then I was about to say they're quite good for opening doors. <laughs> but lucky I didn't. <laughs> Hi, nice to you, lovely to see you. How long, have you. how long have you been working here? Uh, 21 years now. Can you tell me about the building opposite? Because I've always wondered what that building was. It used to be a, a hostel. Yeah, it belonged to a... Palmer from Huntley and Palmer Biscuits. That was his house when he lived there. And this, uh, this, fountain, is that this whole area? area was his garden, and that was his stables over there. Yeah, and the main entrance was on the Finchley Road. Oh, uh, right. So what we're talking about, 1800s? Because what yeah. Huntley Partner, they started in like 1822, I think. I think it was his last. That's where he passed in that oh, house. Oh, really? Yeah, because they found all old invoices upstairs from original orders and stuff, yeah, uh -huh. and a picture of him. I've always thought it was yeah. an amazing house, and I just thought, <laughs> wanted to, I don't know what it is these days, but it's, it's a it, backpacker's hostel. Oh, it is still? Oh, yeah, okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And look, yeah. It's a plaque. It's a There we go, look at that. So, oh, it's quite hard to read this, Simon. It's, uh, it's uh, this fountain in memory of the late, oh, Samuel Palmer. What are the most fragrant flowers? Like those. Okay, those and are nice. So freesias and stocks. Stocks. Yeah. What made you become a florist then? You're not a great train robber or something, right? No, no. Because <laughs> usually great train robbers become florists for some reason. Yeah. I grew up on Maresfield. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So you must have loads of friends who went to the school there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, do you do stuff I by order as well? Can people yeah. order? On harrysflowers.uk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Just across the road there is the Tavistock Centre, which is committed to improving mental health and well-being. It's been there for quite, quite a few years. Could make it a bit more cheerful, yeah, couldn't they? I suppose, but if you're looking out, it looks very nice. Yeah, I guess that's true. Just around the corner from there, the Maresfield Gardens, is South Hampstead High School, where many of our female friends from my youth attended. Hi, girls. <laughs> Ladies, now. Famously, Helena Bonham Carter went there, and Angela Langsbury. Um, uh, murder she wrote. Coming up here on the right is Sigmund Freud's house. Sigmund Freud, well, it's now a museum, but he was the founder of psychoanalysis. I mean, he invented all that stuff to do with the id, the superego, penis envy. He was obsessed with all that stuff, wasn't he? Oedipus complex. Did you ever fancy your mother, Simon? 
some of his quotations. The great question that has never been answered and which I have not yet been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is what does a woman want? <laughs> I'm not sure if he'd have got away with it these days, let's be honest. Giuseppe! Hey, Giuseppe, hey. lovely to meet you. Good to see you. So we are standing in the hallway of Freud's final home here in Hampstead in North London. This is where he spent the last year of his life, having fled Nazi persecution from Vienna in 1938. And this is Sigmund Freud's perfectly preserved study. All of the objects that you see in here, the books, the furnishings, the desk, even the bookshelves came from Bergasse in Vienna, which had been the family home for over 40 years. Imagine getting all this stuff over here in those days. Well, he had help from friends in high places, shall we say, particularly Princess Marie Bonaparte. She was the one who helped Freud come to London and bring his collections over. He was only here for one year, though. Anna Freud, his daughter, herself a pioneer in child psychoanalysis, she lived here for 44 years. Oh, right. Apparently, I'm not allowed to sit on the, the couch. Uh, not, is, yet, not yet, Jules, no, but no. we are uh, hot off the press news. We are about to welcome an exact replica of the couch oh. to the Freud Museum. Oh, so I, wanted finally... to sit, I wanted to sit on it and tell you my personal problems. Well, no, <laughs> not, not yet, but hold the thought. If you come back in the autumn, you will see a replica couch and you can sit on it and do whatever you want on it. Well, not whatever you want, but within, within reason, obviously. But I won't yeah. do that. <laughs> so he would sit there, and while the patients were being psychoanalyzed on the couch, reclining, he would be at his desk, or indeed at the chair next to the couch, but never looking the patient directly in the eye. That was very important for Freud. And he would play with the antiquities, sometimes absent-mindedly, sometimes immersed in thought while listening to the patient and taking notes. And what's all this business to do with uh, the Oedipus complex? And uh, is that something to do with having sex with your mother? Because I just find this all so weird. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's literally about having sex no, with your it, mother. What, is, it, is, it, what is that stuff? Anyway? It goes back to Oedipus Rex. Should well, we go around the house yes, a little bit? Yeah. Everybody... What's that there? Oh, this was Freud's wardrobe. But inside you can see Freud's overcoat, his umbrella, his walking boots. What's that weird thing there? Oh, that, oh that's so sad. That was his prosthetic jaw. Freud suffered from cancer of the jaw for the better part of two decades. Oh, is that, what got, is that what got him in the end? That's what got him in the end. By the end of the li his life, he could barely speak, he could barely open his mouth. Look at that, it's amazing stuff. The cigars that killed him, but which he couldn't give up, which he oh. felt that he needed for his intellectual wow. creative process. Him, him and Co. Same with Columbo, you see. Well, Lieutenant yeah. Columbo, he needed Actually, cigars the too. The are quite similar, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, it's true. <just laughs> didn't know that Columbo and Freud had so much in common. More objects. The Wolfman, who was in fact a Russian aristocrat, who had these recurring dreams about these wolves. And Sigmund Freud encouraged him to paint pictures of them and to recount the dreams. And Freud recorded this as a case study. This was the couch that Anna Freud used for her patients. Every time we see Anna Freud's desk with her typewriter, I always think of uh, Murder, She Wrote. Do you, yeah, yeah, well, no, you know what's funny? Because Angela Langsbury, she went to school opposite. I saw the little table that stood in our breakfast nook The stove we got from mother Where you first learned how to cook It looks so out of place That's him sitting right in that corner there. That same, same guy. Window. How nice. So, yeah. Uh, we also have Freudian slippers. I like that. Freud chocolate cigar. Yeah. Look at that. Perfect. Yeah. This cigar and Freudian slippers. Sounds like a perfect way to end the evening. I can't decide whether these are issues from my childhood or whether they are issues created by myself from maybe overwork. What, what do you think? I, I, I just need some help. The cosy little sofa where we used to kiss and hide. You know what? This is worth money. Is it? Yeah, this is a Thundercats t toy. Is it? Yeah, they, these are worth money. They just left them there. Yeah. Thunder, thunder, thunder. Oh my Thundercats. God. Are you oh. kidding me? What? Action Force, G.I. Joe, sort of thing. Thundercats. They look so dusty there. And no one seemed to care. In a little second-hand store Little odds and ends That we got from our friends Oh, they thrilled my heart See, 
around the corner here, this um, building is that Martina Bergman Osterberg in 1885. She was a Swedish woman. She opened the Hampstead Physical Training College and Gymnasium. So I think it was the first one specifically for women. She also introduced or uh, encouraged the, uh, the gym slip, which was kind of like a slip. It was a bit shorter, pinafore dress, quite short, I think. A bit more practical, I mean. Yeah. But uh, anyway, in 1893, she came back from a trip to the States and she introduced a kind of form of basketball here. And then that developed into what is currently netball. So she kind of introduced netball or it almost invented it, sort of. Look, we're on the corner of Fair Hazel Gardens and what was that road? Canfield Gardens. It's nice around here. And look, on the corner here, if you put your ear to there, can you hear the water running? Yeah, thank oh, That's the River Westbourne running underneath here. Yeah. But London's got all these un underground rivers and it goes all the way down to Kensington Gardens, into the Serpentine. If you go to Sloan Square Station, Tube Station, I think you can look above there's a, there's a tube through which this river runs. Then out through into the Thames near Ranley Gardens, you know, near the Chelsea Pensioners Hospital or whatever. Yeah. Greencroft Gardens is where Douglas Adams lived. And also Hutch from Starsky and Hutch. David Soul lived up that road. Did he really? Yes. Can you believe it? That's surreal. Well, he became a famous singer as well, didn't he, in the 70s? Yes. Yeah. Well, my friend said that he was. Uh, he became f um, well known for doing questionable favours for uh, for musicians. I won't go into any more detail because he met him once by accident. <laughs> Nick. Nick. He's got so many stories. Well, we all have stories. Again, I'm going on about my trip down memory lane, but what's interesting is that here on Aberdare Gardens, number 77, is where one of my favourite singers of all time lived. But actually, he was my dad's favourite singer, Turner Layton. He was a part of a duo with Clarence Johnson in the 1920s and 1930s and stuff. They performed in America, and Lord and Lady Mountbatten sort of said how great they were and invited them over to play in, in London, I think Royal Albert Hall or something. Anyway, and they came over here and they became uh, massively successful. Clarence Johnson then went off and had some sort of affair with a married woman and uh, that was really frowned upon by society at the time so, uh, so they ended up having to split up as a duo but Turner Layton carried on and he lived here. I mean he wrote some very famous songs he did Way Down Yonder in New Orleans, Way Down Yonder in New Orleans, mm -mm -mm. you know that one? After you gone and left me crying, after you gone there's no denying. That was by him. And anyway, what's so amazing about it is that my dad used to play these records all the time. We, only, we didn't live far from here. If only he'd known. So he died in 1978 in the Royal Free Hospital, and he left all his, uh, the rights to his music to the um, children, to, to the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which is really quite nice of him. I must see if they'll let me uh, use uh, one of them for this video, because that would be really nice. But he had a beautiful voice. And if only my dad had known, I only discovered this recently, if only my dad had known that he lived around the corner, he could have walked around and said hello to him. He'd have loved that. It's amazing to think that Clarence Johnson afterwards, he just blew all his money um, and uh, ended up being a janitor or something. Um, yeah, whereas Turner Layton carried on. As a, but he had such a great voice. Going back a day, your wedding day in May, when we said we'd never part. I seem to hear them whisper, you're to blame for you get wrong. Why don't you kiss and make up? Back where we Ooh, what a nice, what a nice looking place. It's like Paris. But they're only serving food after 7 p.m. But look, oh, yeah, yeah. But look, what a beautiful, what a beautiful bar. <laughs> it's a wine bar. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Anytime Monday closed and Tuesday drinks only, and after seven, some platters. Hey, we've got to come here sometime, Simon. Look at this. It's terrific. It broke my heart to see. The home you planned for me in a little second. Just coming up here to South Hampstead Station, but I've just spotted one of these things again. Is that oh, like a 5G mast or something? Yeah. Some sort of G, anyway. What are they? 7G, 8G? What G are they up to now? 8G? Eight. Like, eight <laughs> what is a G, anyway? <laughs> they always remind me of the. Um, 
Do you know the gladiators? Do you ever watch Gladiator? Gladiators ready! Do you remember There's that? Big cotton bud type yeah, thing, the, yeah, and there was one of the one of the the contestants had to sort of fight against the other gladiator and knock them off this podium. <laughs> and then the, these sticks that they had looked a bit like that. He has a giant cotton bud, but they called them pugil sticks. Do you remember? A pug use your pugil stick to, uh, as in pugilism. Anyway, look, South Hampstead Station, this opened in 1879. I mean, it was actually Loudoun Road back then. It reopened after the First World War as, uh, as South Hampstead Station. The tunnel over there, that was built by Robert Stevenson back in 1838. It was the first railway tunnel in London, that. It was a wonder of the age. People flocked to come and watch it being built. That's the Primrose Hill Tunnel. You go through there, it comes out on the other side, oh, sort of goes under, Primrose Hill comes out, now, and it goes up to Euston. Actually, in 1914, Emmeline Pankhurst, the suff famous suffragette, she had been arrested in Glasgow. And they were bringing her down on the train from Glasgow to Euston to go and take her to prison or something. And she had lots of supporters at the front of the train. So I think these supporters were hoping to kind of rescue her or something. But anyway, the train entered the tunnel here and they cunningly knew that her supporters were in the front of the train. She was ushered to the back of the train. Um, so the, the train stopped halfway into the tunnel just so that the, the back carriage with her containing yeah. her was in it. And then the police came and sort of snatched her and took her away to Pentonville Prison. Oh, wow. Right here. How about that? This is the Alexandra and Ainsworth estate. And you might reckon this has been in so many films. This, is, this, is, this has been in... Or well, the Sweeney. Have you seen this? Is in the Sweeney, they come down here. It's, it's also in Kingsman. This is where Eggsy lives in Kingsman. And they, they, they used it in lots of uh, pop videos. Um, our younger viewers, who uh, probably like Dua Lipa, she, uh, they, they might recognise it from her Fever video. And uh, people like me know it more for Kirsty McColl, New England. You know, I don't want to change the world. I'm not looking for New England. She did it here. But look, is it, you can see why people love it for filming. It was by um, Neve Brown was the architect in the 1970s and it was actually the first post-war estate like this to, to receive listed status. So this is these eight stories in, a, in what they call a ziggurat. When the trains go by, the ones on the right create a barrier for these houses on the rest, left so you can't hear the noises of the train quite so badly. How long have you lived on the estate for? Uh, 45 years. So like kind of when it was... When, when it was first built we started off with a one bedroom flat moved to a two-bedroom flat, and then we're now in this three-bedroom as a family group. Really? And it's, it's nice, is it? It's yeah. like it? I don't want to move. I think it's a council estate. You know, you live and let live. We've got four children growing up and seven grandchildren. They all come and enjoy it here. I'm not moving out. Every weekend there's music videos. Filmed, they filmed one film in our flat here. Oh, really? The uh, oh, Never yeah, Never, when they did it about loan sharks. Oh, wow. yeah. But now, you're now, now, now they're filming the, uh, the very, very popular Jules Guides here. Those lifts must be all from the same people. All these lifts. All these estates have these lifts, don't they? Wow. Yeah. I mean, you can sort of look down on people, can't you? You can sort of see people in people's yes. <laughs> front rooms and stuff. It's a nice view. I mean, there's nothing famous that you can see, but I don't know. Oh, you can see the Trellick Tower from here. It's a Hillgrove estate, these bits are along here. It was actually designed in the, in the style of Louis de Soissons, who, who was the architect of the whole of Welling Garden City, actually. Welling Garden City, which is a whole town. Design. Yeah, it was designed specially for healthy living. It was supposed to be the perfect town. Um, I don't know if the people who live here regard this as the perfect place to live, but maybe they do. But this side, it seems quite peaceful, doesn't it? Yeah. It's the other side that they that is the, that big Finchy Road and everything. I say, Simon, what say you to uh, a couple of Harold Pinters at the old Swiss Cottage pub? It's, a, it's, a, it's a strangely isolated in the... See, it wasn't like... This was, this is, was here in 1840. These, these, it was quite fashionable to build uh, pubs in the style of a Swiss chalet for some reason. So they had this Swiss cha chalet here, but back then, of course, there was this beautiful road here. Um, but now, all this new development from the 60s and what have you, seems to have left it strangely isolated. But it's uh, very good for a pint of beer, I hear. Let's go. It broke my heart to see the home you planned for me In a little second-hand store It's a nice 
stay, Simon. Love Cheers. It. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Simon. Thanks. Don't forget to uh, hit the subscribe button if you like these videos, and also check out my book, which is available. Um, you can check, follow the links below, and everything. Very highly recommended. And uh, don't forget to come to the Swiss Cottage, which gives its name to the whole area. See you next time, oh, folks. Why don't you kiss and make up? Take us back where we belong. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, geez, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Way back where we belong. It broke my heart to see the home you planned for me in a little second hand store. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> That's right. Oh, God. Uh, is the, was the sound alright? Was there stuff usable for me?